Jeopardy, the Obama administration prosecuted former CIA Director David Petraeus for mishandling classified information. Yet she's not getting the same treatment that General Petraeus did. There's a double standard here. One standard for him, a four-star general. Other standard for others who've violated classified information. There you go, the growing case versus Hillary Clinton. Contrasting that to David Petraeus, a great place to start our roundtable today with us. Retired Air Force General and former director of the NSA and the CIA, General Michael Hayden, also joining us, former chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, and former U.S. Congressman Pete Hoekstra. Thank you both for being here with us today. Great, good to be with Thank you. you. Thank you. General Hayden, I want to start with you. A lot has been made about the comparisons to what David Petraeus did with classified data and to what Hillary Clinton may have done with her classified data. Hillary's opponents say there is a double standard here because Hillary is not yet being criminally investigated. Do you believe there's a double standard? Well, I don't know whether there's a double standard yet. Let's see how it plays out. I, I think we can say there are some parallelisms here. Uh, it appears, it's certainly in General Petraeus's case, classified information was mishandled. It appears that we have the same kind of circumstance over here in Secretary Clinton's case. And I, I've got to be, be very candid. I don't know how you make it come out happy if you have the Secretary of State using a private email server for all of her official correspondence. There just isn't any way you can get to a good place if that's your system. And I'm just shocked that her staff allowed her to do it for four years. That's right. And, you know, Pete, you look at this, a lot of folks, again, who are supporting Hillary Clinton say what David Petraeus did was actually hand over that classified information to his mistress. But Hillary Clinton apparently handed over a flash drive which mm -hmm. may contain classified data to her, la uh, to her lawyer here. You have the same kind of, or you've seen high-level security uh, clearances stuff. Do you think that there's any way that Hillary Clinton could have properly maintained classified data on a private email server? Well, you know, I was one of the beneficiaries of General Hayden coming in and free frequently briefing uh, the Intelligence Committee on classified information and data. And I can tell you that my staff very rigorously monitored what I would say uh, in public. They would never have let me use uh, my email, whether it was a government email or a personal server, uh, to actually even be talking about classified information uh, through those types of, of mechanisms. The other thing I'd like to point out, right now there's a national security investigation going on uh, you know, in the Justice Department taking a look at exactly what kind of classified information may have been on Hillary Clinton's uh, server, but they are always in very close contact with the criminal uh, investigation folks at the Justice Department. Uh, you know, whether there's a criminal investigation or not, or whether it's a national security investigation, may be at a distinction without any meaning. These people are talking to each other right now. Yeah, and General Hayden, real quickly, just to follow up on what Pete said there, uh, we reported this last week, and it's coming from Judicial Watch. At least five government intelligence agencies, including the NSA and the CIA, reportedly sent classified emails to Hillary Clinton's private address. So that's very, very concerning. And, and, and you know, what you were saying, I think, is true. There's no way that this ends up positive for Hillary Clinton. No, it, it doesn't. And, and it's, it's almost tragic because once you start down this path, you, you can't make it right. You can't segregate, disaggregate the official from the non-official, the secret from the not secret. But look, if the Secretary of State offers a view on a foreign official in an email, that generally earns at least a confidential classification. So yeah. it's almost unavoidable well. that you're going to find that kind of data in the system. Gentlemen, when we come back, uh, we want to continue our conversation with you and talk about foreign policy and, dare we say it again, Trump. So stick around. We'll be right back. And we welcome you back for part two of our roundtable with us again, retired Air Force General and former director of the NSA and the CIA, General Michael Hayden. Also back with us, former chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Pete Hoekstra. Uh, first to you, General Hayden, then I'll give you a chance to answer here, Pete. There are going to be a few governors up on that stage on Thursday night with limited foreign policy experience. How can the American public watching at home tell if a particular candidate actually knows his or her stuff when it comes to foreign policy? What are you looking out for? Well, 
number one, don't expect anyone up there to know all the fine print. That's why they have staff. That's why they have national security advisors. That's why they have CIA directors. What you want is a certain comfort level and a, and a vision with which you are comfortable when it comes to how one or another candidate say, sees America's role in the world. Right now, my view is we have been playing too far back. We have not been involved. So let's see which of the candidates up there talk about a bit more robust American involvement in global issues to defend our self-interest. All right, what about you, Pete? Well, I think that's exactly right. There are a number of the governors that don't have the foreign policy experience. What is their vision? How realistic are there? Are, are there visions? You know, immediately pulling out of uh, an Iran deal or immediately going into Syria. We know that these issues are much more complicated uh, than that. We need someone who can go up there, who can understand the issues, identify the right people uh, to put in place their vision for the future. But they have to be comfortable talking about these issues. And I think in foreign policy, you have to walk away from making absolutes. It's not that easy. Foreign policy is very, very difficult. Yeah. Well, speaking of foreign policy, when examining the most important issues that are facing our country, primary voters in this WMUR, University of New Hampshire poll, which just came out yesterday, ranked foreign policy as the second most important issue just behind the economy. Now, what's interesting in that same poll, it shows when it comes to foreign policy, Trump once again leads the path with 21% 20, rather declaring him as the best candidate to handle terrorism. General, I'm going to start with you. Are you at all surprised that voters would prefer Trump? And should they? I, I guess I'm a little less surprised that the voters would prefer Mr. Trump in this year, in 2015. If they're in that position in 2016 and he hasn't gotten more nuanced and sophisticated and more clear in what his foreign policy would be, I, I, would, be, I would be really uh, quite stunned if that were the case then. Pete, I want to ask you, do you think Trump's business dealings overseas have anything to do with the logic behind choosing Trump versus, say, a Jeb Bush who came in at second, only getting 13 percent of the vote? Well, I think it's clear that Trump, you know, touting his international experience, saying I've negotiated with the Chinese, I've negotiated with the Russians, I've negotiated, gives people a certain level of comfort and belief that, hey, this guy does know how to work internationally. He's been successful, so obviously he's at least negotiated with them on a par. But I think as you start going through some of the other candidates, you take a look at the governor of Ohio, John Kasich. John has 18 years of experience on the Armed Services Committee in the House. Uh, he's also, uh, you know, been a governor. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that all flushes itself out. The bottom line is voters know very little about any of these candidates and where they stand on foreign policy and their experience. You know, up until recently, foreign policy would have been number seven or eight on the list of their priorities. Right. Right. Most of the time, American people don't pay much, much attention to foreign policy. So, so the general told us what he's hoping to hear, which is America's role when it comes right. to leading the world. Pete, what are you hoping to hear, or what would you advise voters to listen for when watching these debates? Well, I think really what they've got to be looking for is exactly what Mike laid out. They need to understand the vision, uh, what America is capable of doing, what our limits are, and how we are going to exercise America's great strength, both military, economically, and politically. Yeah, you know, and, and you just talked about this, Pete. If we could put that poll back up on the screen, I think it's very interesting. And this goes back to something that we've been talking about for a long time with the rise of ISIS, with the concerns about Russia and Vladimir Putin, where foreign policy stands on the minds of the American voter. It's almost always the case that domestic economy is, is the main issue yeah. when it comes to voters. But this goes to show us how important mm -hmm. foreign policy is going to be on the campaign trail uh, in this particular election cycle. Out of all the candidates right now, gentlemen, who do you think has a leg up? Is it John Kasich? Do you agree with Pete Hoekstra, General Hayden? Well, I, I advise Governor Bush. I've, I've met with Governor Bush. He has the kind of patient, sophisticated, let's not rush in here, let's listen to all views approach to foreign policy that I think Chairman Hoekstra was referring to earlier. There are others up there, too, who have that, but I've seen it in, in Governor Bush. All right, one vote for Governor Bush, one vote for, 
for John Kasich. Should be an interesting yeah. uh, debate nonetheless. Gentlemen, thanks so much for being with us. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Good discussion there. Coming up next, mm -hmm. we're going to bring you to the top, uh, the top money stories of the day. Yeah. Uh, oil continues to fall. To Puerto Rico. Wow. Puerto Rico, too. Yeah, we're going to talk to senior financial editor Tom Hutchinson, who authors our high-income factor newsletter about the possible contagion that is Puerto Rican default.